um, because it's bad at its job. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this thing that has more participants coming in every second. Weird. Okay, so this is a webinar on executive function and neurodivergence. It uh, is something that I've run before two times, and it's accidentally too many people now because I said something funny on the internet. I apologize. Um, so today, um, I'm just going to go over a few slides to introduce us and get us all on the same page. And then um, I will cover some of the common questions that I received in the registration form. And then we will open it up to Q&A. Um, Yes, this will be recorded and the recording will be uploaded. And also I have a recording of a previous version that I can also share. Um, and so I just, I think that there's no waiting room and I think that everybody, okay, theoretically you see big slides. Okay. All right, so this, I want to start with, um, this webinar is based on research that I have done with autistic adults and middle schoolers about the ways that we cope with and manage our executive function issues. And what I have found largely is that one of the keys is being kind to ourselves and abolishing shame. So um, a little bit about me, I'm just a person, uh, They, I tricked them into giving me a doctorate and I'm here now. Um, so I do scholarship on disability, technology and society. And um, I try to make human computer interaction as a computer science discipline less mean and they don't like it. Um, so what brought you all here is a sense of struggling with executive function. And that covers a wide range of people, um, people that identify as autistic or ADHD, OCD, even people who are aging in place or have had a traumatic brain injury, and especially people who are experiencing dysautonomia and long COVID from our ongoing pandemic crisis. Um, the things that you all share are executive functions uh, and executive dysfunction. So executive function is something that everybody has. It, it's not a real thing. So nothing is real, right? So executive function is a construct that we use to describe this like process by which you can make plans and execute things. And even though it's a construct, it's obviously useful for describing our experiences wherein some of us struggle more with doing things, how to do things. Um, and so executive functions are found to be more difficult for people with neurodevelopmental conditions or for people who are currently in a very depressive state. Uh, also aging and conditions of aging such as menopause or mild cognitive impairment, which is like what they call pre-dementia. Uh, and also injuries such as physical or emotional trauma can make your executive function temporarily more difficult to deal with. What does this feel like? What is the experience of executive dysfunction? Feeling stuck? being unable to do something that you want or need to do, making a mistake during a repetitive task, something that you usually do well, like making the wrong turn when you're driving to work, feeling disoriented um, and being confused, like the thing where you walk into the room and you can't remember why, that one. Um, and so most of you here, um, because you were attracted to the session, by the phrase neurodivergence and executive function are familiar with executive function and, and know what it is and what it means for you. Um, in my research, what I found was that this other concept called metacognition is something that we study a lot in relation to executive function, but we only really study it when the studies are about military officers, surgeons, and sports. And then also sometimes in education when it's about reading, but never in special education. So there's this thing that we've identified as being essential to mitigating the effects of executive function. And we only study it when we're talking about soldiers and surgeons and sports ball players 
and that's really weird. Um, but everybody also has metacognition. We all develop these overt strategies for thinking through problems. These are our conscious and deliberate strategies and beliefs that we use to work through problems. Um, one of the reasons why clinical literature identifies neurodivergent people as having impaired metacognition is actually a social factor, that these strategies are often acquired through enculturation, which means that the process of learning these things is invisibilized. So if you ever got to college and then suddenly realized that you didn't know how to study, but everybody else seemed to know how to study, that's what happened. So we don't always internalize these strategies because they're not being taught to us in a way that's accessible to us. And instead what we internalize is ableism and shame. So hopefully this session can help us all work through finding new metacognitive strategies that are not based in shame. I clicked a button and it didn't work. Oh my God, please be alive. There we go. So what are metacognitive strategies? Some of these are things that you've probably heard of before and maybe even tried and they didn't work out for you or they're not enough. And that's also fun. The most common one that we talk about is task chunking and the idea of taking a big task and making it smaller, explicit steps. Um, visual and tactile metacognitive strategies are actually um, one of those that are more highly studied in uh, military sports and surgeon contexts, but not for everybody else. And yet in the disability community, we know that these things work very well. So representing tasks in prominent spaces or places where you can feel or visualize these things is very helpful. So uh, there are no sticky note police and you're all allowed to have as many post-it notes as you want. And visual schedules, even though they were made for children, um, you can use them too. And nobody can make fun of you for that. Um, I think a lot of us know about the concept of body doubling or echopraxia. Uh, and there are some reasons why this doesn't work sometimes and we'll talk about it. And then my favorite metacognitive strategy is actually anti-ableism. So if you internalize a sense of disabled identity and community, you can revolutionize your relationship with yourself. Um, also from my research, uh, there's this terrifying graphic on the screen, which I will describe for you. And speaking of descriptions, I did not describe myself. I am a middle-aged queer person as indicated by my asymmetrical side shave haircut and my giant cicada earrings. I am a white neurodivergent mad and disabled person. Um, I have twinkle lights behind me, but half of them need new batteries. All right, so when I did my research with autistic adults, um, I identified several themes about how they implemented metacognitive strategies to support them throughout their days. Some of these were explicitly mental, like memorizing their own routines and rules and rituals. Some were more embodied and they were having to deal with um, using their own sense of need for emotion or um, ex like explicitly trying to sensory regulate themselves in a way that achieved better I don't wanna use the word productivity because I hate it, but that's the word that I'm saying. Um, there were environmental ones too, which it, you can't really do sensory regulation without an environmental manipulation. So there's a lot of work that people are doing to control the sound and light um, in the feel of space. My favorite actually was using objects as reminders. I had several participants that would do things like leaving something in front of the door or taping something to their monitor or even taping something to the uh, steering wheel of their car to make sure that they took care of that thing first because it was in their way. Um, and then um, one of my actual like favorite things that I saw people doing was a social form of metacognition in which we help each other do things even when those are things that we can't do for ourselves. Um, and one of the things that's required to form those kinds of connections with each other is overcoming shame and realizing that it's actually okay to ask each other for help. And this is why an earlier version of this webinar was called The Magic of Friendship. Um, so 
so I want to know what time it is before I do this, but I actually can't see it. And I have a whole phone, a whole computer right in front of me. Okay, it's fine. So through this research, I came up with three different stories that represented the participants. And I'm actually going to play them for you um, for a few reasons. One, a dear friend of mine and really great voice actor, Ren Basil, did the voice acting for these stories. And I would like to show appreciation for their work. Um, and also because I think that the progression of these stories helps understand the kinds of things that I'm getting at here. So in this first story, Moss, every solution feels like more work than the original problem. And this is often where a lot of us are when we come into knowing, okay, I'm neurodivergent and I have problems with executive function, but every solution that gets thrown at you is just keep a planner or <laughs> just keep a calendar. And it all becomes new systems that you have to upkeep on top of your own human system. Uh, the next person is Leaf. Um, and it really, this story shows how much the outcome is dependent on how much agency a person has. So when you have full control over your living environment, you tend to do better. Uh, and then that's actually kind of a disappointing finding because that's often uh, something that we don't actually have control over. We often do not have control over the fact that we've been put in a situation where we don't have control over our own living space. And that's something that disproportionately affects neurodivergent people because they wind up in um, uh, living with family or or having roommates longer than other people or living in group homes, et cetera, and not having that agency over their home lives. Um, and then and then echo the third story is about what can happen when we have um, meaningful interpersonal relationships with other neurodivergent and disabled people. Um, let me, I'm going to actually, I'm going to do this because I bet it's not going to work. Nope, that's not it. All right. I'm gonna do it this way because I feel like I don't trust it to work any other way. So we're gonna play Moss's story now. Moss, Moss grunts, grunts as their alarm beeps at them desperately for the fifth time this morning. They reluctantly rise, sort through unfolded laundry, select their favorite shirt and jeans and head out the door. As they leave, they pass a stack of unused planners, but a note by the door reminds them to grab their wallet, keys, phone and to check that their backpack has their headphones and sunglasses. Moss puts on their headphones and sunglasses as they exit their apartment building. By blasting their favorite music, they can remain calm as they wait for the bus at a crowded stop. Someone bumps into them as they board the bus and they sense a flood of overwhelm. Quickly, they reach into the pockets of their hoodie and find a fidget ring that they use to calm their nerves as they wait for their stop. The sunglasses will help prevent them from getting a migraine, and they leave them on as they head into work. They nod to their co-workers as they settle into their desk. They check their calendar to see that they missed a doctor's appointment by accident. They haven't found a reminder system that works for them. Moss does their job well, but they always feel like they are one mistake away from catastrophe. They check their phone and see a chat notification from a friend. Moss thinks about telling them how difficult things are for them right now, but they don't want to be a burden and they don't know how their friend could help anyway. I've seen other people do this, where they directly came and supported each other when they had a hard time functioning, but I haven't done that. I've always had the sense that it would either be a burden or they couldn't actually help me. Moss grunts Oops. as their alarm okay. beeps. So that was Moss's story. And I... I think probably some of you might identify with that story. Um, and here is Leaf's story. Leaf wakes up as the lights in their room gently fade on. Last year, they purchased a set of smart lights and programmed them to adjust throughout the day in a way that supports their sleep schedule. Leaf pulls a pair of pants and a shirt from a drawer and chuckles at how many of the clothes are the same cut in different colors. They like what they like. Leaf works from home, so it's very important to them that their space is well delineated so that they can maintain a sense of routine and order, even though they don't often leave the house. 
Their desk is tidy, but only because they force themselves to clean it every night so that it is fresh for them the next day. As Leaf settles into work, they realize that their stomach hurts and that they are getting a headache. They sigh with relief because they have built an entire library of preset emails and detailed how-to documents so that they can continue working even when they don't feel their best. Leaf often feels guilty when they think about how flexible their work is. They worry about other autistic people who don't have the autonomy and freedom to control their own lives. At noon, their smartwatch vibrates gently with a reminder, eat a sandwich. At 12.15, they realize they still haven't eaten when they glance at their calendar and see the color-coded block of time labeled, no really, go eat. At 12.37, they get a text message from their friend. Have you eaten yet? Leaf responds, yeah, no, and laughs when their friend sends them a selfie with a bowl of cereal. Leaf goes to make their sandwich. Leaf wakes up as the lights in their room oh, gently oh, fade on. So that was Leaf's story and here's the last story before I actually get into some concrete Q&A. Um, this is Echo's story. Echo wakes up when their cat, Tizzy, demands that they be fed. The cat has obviously never been fed before in its life. As they head to the kitchen, they pass visual aids on the wall that their roommate uses to communicate and to remember tasks. The truth is, everyone in the house uses them, even though they are only for Abby, who is non-speaking. There's a sticky note on the cat food bin that reminds Echo to give Tizzy medication with breakfast. Echo adds Tizzy's medicine to the bowl. Then they make themselves a bowl of cereal and take their own meds. They look at Tizzy and say, <laughs> what a pair we are. Echo looks over and notices the paperwork for their legal name change is sitting unfinished on the kitchen table. They groan. They have had the forms for four months and can't ever get through them. They text their friend, why are forms? Their friend responds, LOL, mood. Their friend is trying to apply for a new job, but keeps getting frustrated by the online forms. Echo starts a video chat with their friend. Okay, we both hate forms. We both have forms. Let's both fill out forms. They sit online together, working through their paperwork. Occasionally, one will complain about their form, the other commiserates. In just 20 minutes, they both have completed something they had been putting off for a long time. What a pair we are, says Echo. Executive support squad activate, says their friend. Echo remembers a time when they felt embarrassed and ashamed about their forgetfulness and disorganization and would never ask for help or tell other friends that they were struggling. They are so grateful now to be living in physical and digital community with people who care for one another. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, Echo wakes up no when talking. their cat, Tizzy, demands okay. that they be fed. I would like to take a that minute for the cat has the room, obviously never fed been fed to, before. I'm actually going to I'm going to re-enable the chat real quick and program I want to make sure that there's the nobody in a way that dealing with their sleep a critical schedule. access issue Leaf as I get into the actual pants and a shirt from a drawer and chuckles at how the audio is playing at once. Oh my god, that's horrific. They like what they like. Oh my god. No, that would be terrible. Okay, does it stop yet? Oh my lord. Okay. I'm so sorry, everyone. I could not hear anything. Let me do something that I know should prevent that, which is to not be in slideshow mode at all and to just show the slides from the inside of PowerPoint. Okay? Okay. How long was that happening? Okay. I was worried it was going on for like five minutes and I was gonna lose my mind. Okay. I'm sure that that was a horrific experience because I know that if it had happened in this room, I would have been flailing and it would have been fun for you all to witness. Okay. Wow. All right, all right. I'm going to, okay. I'm going to um, disable the chat again, just so that I can keep the caption link as the first thing there. And we will put, we'll turn it back on again later. And we'll move on to the QA part um, of the thing. And I'm uh, sorry for the audio assault. That's really a bummer. 
Okay. Now, so this is the part of the talk that's about actually addressing things that people that are attending have asked about. Um, there were some big themes that I want to touch on before we begin the open Q&A, because I think that that would be helpful, because there's 200 of you, which is a lot of people. Um, there was um, a lot of people asking, like, how to get unstuck, like, all kinds of stuck, like stuck on the couch, uh, uh, you know, uh, and the big kind of stuck, the big scary thing vortex where you have the thing that you have to do and it makes it so you can't do any other things, but you also can't do that thing because it's the big scary thing. Um, and so um, there are lots of different ways to manage that and they all uh, depend on context, obviously. I'm trying to catch these hands to make sure that you're okay, but for the most part, I can't, I'm not sure if they're because you wanna ask a question or because there's a problem. Um, so some of the ways that we deal with these are actually to recognize that avoidance is a symptom. It's not a trait. You're not naturally avoidant. And yes, I am very well aware of the pathological demand avoidance construct within autism. I think that it's probably better understood as um, like an executive dysfunction overwhelm situation where any demand becomes a huge tax on somebody's executive function and processing about what to do next. Um, and so what I, what I recommend is actually thinking not how to brute force your way into doing the thing, which maybe works every now and then, but also leads to burnout, but actually to think through what is it about this that I hate so much and what can I do about that? So for example, if the big scary thing is calling the doctor's office to make an appointment and the reason why you don't wanna do it is because you hate phone calls. And the reason that you hate phone calls is because every time you call the doctor, the receptionist acts like a bouncer. And if you don't say the right words, you don't get the appointment then that's a really valid reason to not want to call the doctor because receptionists are mean. So <laughs> you could do a number of things. You could write down what you want to say and what you need. Or, and this is something that, again, like I said before, sometimes we can help each other with things that we can't do ourselves. I, I think that I'll probably just die because I won't call the doctor, but I have, and I will continue to call the doctor for friends of mine. I have pretended to be my friends for pharmacists and for, you know, I just give them my friend's information and I just use my mouth parts. It's not illegal. I'm just being a communication assistant. I'm revoicing, which is actually something that people with affective speech use all the time. Um, I just using it for somebody that could speak if it weren't for the fact that they hated the doctor so much. Um, and that's an example. And we can do an example of walking back through somebody else's problem too uh, later. Another way to deal with these, with the stuckness and the big scary thing vortex is whose standards are these? And I usually phrase this as like, just lower your standards, but I think that kind of like messes with people. And I think it would be better to actually think about if you're thinking that I should do this or I should be able to do that, who says so? Uh, this is actually a big deal in parenting. For example, um, it took a number of years for me to convince my partner that it was actually fine if the children stood up and like danced around the table in the restaurant um, because they're not hurting anybody. And then actually they might eat. <laughs> um, but for a long time, my partner felt like they had to constantly discipline the children to make them sit still because you're supposed to sit still in the restaurant really, you're just supposed to pay them for food and eat it. Like, that's all that really matters. So uh, developing a way to question standards and evaluate, okay, well, what are the standards I actually want versus the ones that you feel like are given to you by a society that really doesn't actually care about you? 
um, that that can actually help sometimes work through a problem. And then one of my favorite things is this idea that you, <laughs> this is a little bit of a meta meme. It's kind of in reference to Ron Swanson from, um, why did I just forget the name of the show when I talk about it all the time? And I literally think the show was based on the town that I live in. You know, Leslie Nope. Anyway, you don't have to whole ass one thing, actually. You can multi ass. And this, this is related to the idea that whenever you're having trouble meeting deadlines or making appointments, everybody's always like, you should keep a journal, you should keep a planner, you should keep a diary. And they, um, and you buy the planner and it doesn't work out for you, or you try bullet journaling and it just seems like this big clusterfuck, or you try one of the apps like to-do list or even Habitica, and it's just not working. I have found that it can sometimes be really helpful to, to let people have more than one thing. But the biggest barrier to that is understanding that the system doesn't have to be perfect and the journal doesn't have to be perfect. I could not bullet journal until I stopped caring about whether or not the page had scribbles on it. So if you're looking at Pinterest bullet journals, you're never gonna like it. <laughs> um, but I don't just use a bullet journal and a bullet journal did not solve my problems. Um, I have a paper journal that I use sometimes when I think it's working for me. It hasn't worked for me since grad school. I don't use it anymore, really. Um, I have a Trello board that I use sometimes when I'm trying to write a really big paper. Um, I used that for my qualifying exam and I didn't really need to use it again after that. I have like eight calendars and I have multiple to-do apps and I just use the one that I like at the time. Um, and this is me giving an example for me, and it makes me sound like a weird motivational speaker, but that's not what this is. So, well, um, and then, you know, we talked about sometimes you can just brute force it. It can be bad for you to do this forever, but sometimes you can do this in a way that's gentle to yourself. And I call it urgency hacking. And it's where you are self-aware of the fact that you have made yourself a fake urgency or a fake deadline, right? But that you like sort of make an agreement with yourself to take it seriously. And sometimes it works. Uh, one of the reasons that it works is that it actually releases the pressure from you. So for example, if you have a deadline, right? You give yourself the fake deadline that's like a week before that. And then what happens is when you are not able to meet that deadline at a leisurely pace, you still have this whole buffer of a week to get through it. Um, for some people, what happens is they just keep pushing the deadline and then they miss it anyway. And I would say that that was actually avoidance as a symptom. And there might've been some other problem that kept them from starting the task. Uh, and the number one thing that we really have to work on together is abolishing the shame that we all have, that we've all taken on from a society that thinks that we're deficient and not just divergent. So now we're gonna look at the big QA together and um, we're gonna answer some of these questions. I hope that somebody answered this. Schedule for an hour, done. How would you try to talk to your friends to not internalize shame, get into abusive relationships, ask for help, body double? Um, I don't know how to talk about everything I've learned about neurodivergence and shame and not diagnose everyone with autism and ADHD. That's that's great. Okay, so how do you bring this sort of like radical self-acceptance to a space where you don't actually know everybody's like neuro flavor? Um, that's great, but th there's actually, there's two problems. One is that we actually, it's been scientifically studied that we congregate on accident. So sometimes when your friend figures out that they're autistic and 10 of you figure out that you're autistic too, it's not like a social contagion. It's not fake. It's because you all gravitated towards each other for a reason. Um, at the same time, a lot of people don't like hearing like, oh, you think everybody's autistic. Oh, you think everybody has ADHD and they don't want to hear it. Well, that's why I started this talk talking about how everybody has executive function and everybody struggles with it from time to time because there are so many things that influence it. Um, depression, right, 
as a clinical condition seems like something that only happens to some people, but everybody goes through these periods where they're not feeling good. Um, and that impacts their executive function. Uh, <laughs> racism and poverty impact your executive function because you're spending all of your time fighting against a system that wants you to suffer. Uh, these are things that happen to everybody and we all have to deal with them. And it's not about some page out of the, the DSM, it's actually just about understanding yourself and each other. So one of the ways that you can work on this kind of like abolishing shame and asking for help is to just be explicit about the things that you would like. It actually has a lot to do with boundary work. I worry about that because there's a lot of clinical speak that has taken the term boundaries and really messed it up. Boundaries are like fences. If it's not marked and the gates aren't labeled, then it's not really a boundary. And some people live their lives with boundaries that are actually electrified, electrified fences under the ground and you cross over it and they shock you and they scream at you. And actually it's like, but you didn't put a fence up actually. So be explicit about your wants and your needs and why you want those things. And also be explicit about the things that you would wanna do for others. And I think that, um, I think that uh, if somebody reacts to that with a sense of defensiveness or shame, that that's their problem and not your problem. And you can do what you can to support them through that, but you don't have to take it on as your personal failing. I don't know if that was good answer to question or not. Uh, I'm trying to say that I was gonna answer this live and I can't figure out how. I'm just gonna say I answered it. Um, tips for writing papers. Yes, I have, I have explicit tips for writing papers. Um, my first tip on writing a paper is make sure that it's a paper you want to write. And that's really hard when you're in school and you've sometimes been assigned a paper that you don't want to write. Uh, um, and this is some this is a kind of support that I do my best to provide to my students since I am a teacher, but not everybody has a teacher who does this. And so what I try to do is help students make the paper relevant to them. And that makes it easier to do. But if you have a paper that you feel is not relevant to you and you can't figure out how to make it relevant to you, that's kind of what you can use office hours for. But if you have just like an unapproachable, mean ass teacher, then you might figure that out with somebody else that you're close with. Once you have a paper that you want to write, <laughs> then I don't want to log in again. How do I log in? Do I log in like this? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't log in like this. Do I log in the other way? Hey, okay. Um, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do it every time, but I find that if you do this just once, it really helps. I had for my graduate program, a qualifying exam that was basically a systematic literature review of all human computer interaction related to autism intervention. So I found every single paper that I wanted to read and I put them in a big spreadsheet. And then I pulled them off and I put them on this Trello board and I divided them by topics. And I threw them in here. And after I read each paper, I entered all of my notes into here. Um, some of these were quotes, things that I, really hated, <laughs> um, like uh, 
one of one of the things that kept coming up was this idea like, oh, we can't make technologies for autism intervention because they're already so obsessed with technology. And there's actually literally no evidence that autistic children are more obsessed with technology than any other person, but okay. Um, once I had done this, I had a handle on what each section should talk about and how it was referenced by the literature. This is one way that you can get yourself through writing literature review type papers. Um, and once you kind of do it, you might not ever have to do it like this again. And I, and I, I didn't ever do it like this again. Um, the other way to write papers is to force yourself to start with the outline. Like, and it doesn't have to look like an outline. Just think to yourself, these are the three things that I wanna say. And then you have to keep going in between the lines and filling in those lines until you've filled out like a paper. Also, especially if you're in grad school and you're I, and you're trying to become a writer or or an academic or the scholar of some kind, one of the things that stops us is this idea that when we are finished with the paper that it's done, but it's never done. I write stuff and I edit it and I send it to friends and they help me edit it. And I send it into a journal and two reviewers scream at me for five pages about how bad it is. And I edit it and, <laughs> and it just keeps changing. And then like two years later, I read the paper again and I scream about how I would have edited it. So like, you don't have to be done when you hit that last period. Um, it's okay to never feel done. And it's okay to submit something when it doesn't feel done because it's better to get your grade. <laughs> than to just keep not submitting it. Okay. Um, so, there's so many good things in here and I, they're so important. They're all so important. Um, I'm going to try to keep these questions too and answer them on my sub stack when I don't get through all of them. If you're in community with people and it feels like you're doing all of the work or that you're not, or that you're overworking yourself, then that's not a healthy community. And it's, you're, you're gonna have to make some sacrifices where you take care of yourself. Um, Um, this question about doing the thing that you actually want to do and enjoy doing, um, like I said before, avoidance is a, a symptom and there may actually be something that causes you to feel like you need to avoid the things that you want to do. Sometimes it's shame. Sometimes it's that you don't feel like you deserve to do the thing that you want to do. And sometimes it's concern that like, if it's an art project, that it's not going to be perfect or that it's not actually gonna come out good. Or sometimes when it's a, a game, it's like, well, will you actually be able to get to a stopping spot when it's time for you to go? Um, one of the things I think that really helps is, um, a lot of us get classified as perfectionists as children. And I think that has a lot to do with the idea that perfection is a way that we feel we can keep ourselves out of trouble. It didn't work, you guys. We all still kept getting in trouble. Uh, <laughs> And so that perfection actually interferes with our ability to do the things that we care about because we've latched onto it as a way to protect ourselves, but it's actually not keeping us safe anymore. And it never was. Um, job apps. That's one of those things that I really think we do really well when we have a body double for. And so maybe your friend doesn't have job apps to fill out, but they have to pay bills or something, but it is really hard to fill out a form. We are literally disordered in like eight different ways when it comes to filling out forms. Forms suck and they're not fair. Um, and job apps are just giant forms. And not only are they giant forms, but you write documents and then you have to put those documents into the forms and also fill out extra questions in the forms and everything that you wrote in the document, they want you to repeat again in, in the forms. It's a nightmare. And sometimes the only way to get through it is to 
parallel play with somebody for a minute. Um, sir, you have 22 credit hours. That's too many credit hours. They should not be letting you do that. That's too many. Don't let that happen to you. That's too many. Um, phone usage. The phone usage thing is complicated because we get pathologized for using our phones, but actually our community is often in our phones. And um, so there's like a way to think about, is this phone, is this phone usage actually me uh, being in community with people or am I just doom scrolling? And differentiating the different the difference between those two things and yeah can burnout be categorized as trauma um, burnout is definitely a consequence of trauma um, once you've had a really significantly debilitating episode of burnout then you can become triggered by anything that feels like slipping into that state again. Um, yeah. I feel lots of shame that everyone else in my classes can turn and work on time. Um, and that paralyzes me when working. This is really hard, but those other people have things that you don't. Even if some of those other people are also neurodivergent, they have things that you don't. They have support and security. Some, like Sometimes when you can't do stuff on time, it's not just because you're ADHD or just because you're autistic. It's also because you're worried about making rent or you're worried about what you're gonna eat. Like, And if you think that, oh, well, I don't have any of those problems, I'm sure you have some kind of problem. And, and don't compare yourself to other people. It's never ever going to help. Um, what I tell people uh, when they're still struggling with avoidance of something, even though they've tried a lot of strategies is that they probably haven't figured out what the avoidance is actually a symptom of. There is something that makes that task so scary for you. Um, and sometimes it's not that it's not broken down enough. Sometimes it's not that you're afraid it won't be perfect, but sometimes it's what if it's not actually what you're supposed to do or you know, what if you do it wrong or I, there's, there's other reasons. So when you're trying a bunch of strategies and they're not working, th that's really when it's time to ask for help. And this can be really scary because you're talking about something at a job and I don't know your relationship to people that are at your job, but this is the kind of situation where I would ask somebody at the job for help, but that takes a lot of trust and security that not everybody has. And so it's not really fair, right? Um, as a faculty person in a university, it's really typical for faculty to be like rude and shitty to staff. It's like a thing, um, but I actually really rely on the staff here specifically for things that would be job accommodations, except that I don't delude myself into thinking that HR would ever actually accommodate my brain. So I just, ask them for help and they'll sit with me and help me fill out a form. Um, one of them is on this call right now. Uh, but again, these are things that not everybody has access to. And I realize that a lot of times some of the things that I say are things that um, we need a better world for them to work. Um, 
this one about the existential dread of capitalism. Yeah, that's rough, buddy. This is the thing. I mean, we can't, we can't, like, these are not like pull yourself up by your bootstraps webinars. Like, you can't <laughs> strategize your way out of late stage capitalism, climate disaster, and poverty. Um, when I see something like this, I what I see is somebody who really needs friendship and community. You can't deal with that kind of existential dread alone. Um, most of us are actually multiply disabled. Um, first of all, the DSM is a construct and most of it is fake and none of us are just one page. Most of us are like several pages out of the DSM. And then also there's some physical things that coincide with a lot of our conditions. Uh, many of us knew what dysautonomia was before long COVID. Um, and so what happens when you have flares and you've got like multiple problems all happening at the same time? Uh, that, that's a big moment for reflecting on whose standards are these. And um, Um, I just, I'm hitting the capacity on my executive function with this call because there's like 42 questions and there's still 200 of you in here. <laughs> it's wild. Okay. Um, oh, the imposter syndrome about the condition. <laughs> so not the imposter sy in sy syndrome about like that you're good at stuff, but the idea that you're not actually entitled to abolishing shame because you think that maybe you're faking it and you don't actually have a condition. Uh, you know that like, maybe you don't know this, but there's like this trans joke about wanting to be a girl is the number one symptom of being a girl. <laughs> Feeling like there's something wrong with you is the number one symptom of there being something wrong with you. Like there are people who go through their lives and never think that they're different from other people. I know it sounds fake because there's like 200 of us in this room, but like, yeah. Um, you're not faking it. Other people have all kinds of things worse, but that doesn't mean that you're faking it. Curious about the average age in here. I don't know. I know that uh, usually my audience tends to be older, but nah. yeah, there are some babies in here. Oh, hi, babies. Um, <laughs> meal planning. Um, yeah, two things about meal planning. One, well, actually, maybe three things. One, this idea that we cook everything for ourselves is actually really new. Thanks, 1950s, you ruined everything. Um, it was actually a lot more normal to eat like street food and food from diners and restaurants. Like that was like a thing, it was normal. It was also cheaper, now it's not. Anyway, um, also embrace your same foods. <laughs> like if I could eat avocado toast with eggs every morning for the rest of my life, I would, and I would not care. Nobody could tell me that it was weird. And I would eat soup every night for dinner and I would not care, it'd be fine. Embrace your same foods and find the kinds of same foods that you can pull together when you're out of everything else and just like have your emergency struggle rations, okay? Um, parents that don't believe you. One of the reasons they don't believe you is because they think that you're not different from them because you're not, because they are also neurodivergent because the number one cause of neurodivergence is neurodivergent people fucking. So one of the reasons why they're denying your ADHD is because they don't want to look at it in themselves. Um, now you might not be able to talk them through that, 
right? But that's where the denial is coming from. Oh, and if any of you have that parent that works in special education or is a child therapist, I'm sorry, because they will never, ever, ever, ever give in <laughs> to the idea that they didn't catch it. <laughs> um, Oh my God, I see some same foods showing up in the Q&A and I love it, it's great. I'm going to open up the chat real quick um, for the rest of these because I'll be able to save the chat and then catch questions that I um, missed, right? And so we have some of these in the, the Q&A and um, yeah. So I know that I missed some, there was like, 50 of them and I just kind of kept scrolling and answering the ones I could see. Uh, <laughs> this is this is wild. Um, I can't believe that so many people came to this just because I made a shit post about not being a robot. <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, you all helped John Misha get the deposit for her new apartment. And this is really great. So John Mishi is a real human being that I personally know, and I have held her children, <laughs> okay? She has three children and they're really beautiful. And one of them is medically complex. And she had to move away from the town that I live in so that her youngest daughter could get care for her heart at Ann Arbor. Um, and she's been in prison before and she's been homeless before and she's been homeless with her children before. Uh, this time, two years ago, I think, Maybe it was just last year, Jesus. I think it was just last year. Anyway, this time last year, we were trying to get her out of a homeless shelter and we did that. And so now we've gotten her into a new place. And um, I really, really appreciate everybody who came here. Even if you didn't donate, your attention helped us raise that money for my friend. And I really appreciate you. Um, the when I send out the recording and the thank you follow-up email about this, I will mention the fundraiser again. Please do not feel pressured if you are uh, like, if you can't do this, then you can't do this, right? But if you share it, um, then that would be that would be good because they um, they need um, they still need clothes and food and um, if they don't have the right kinds of beds, the state tries to take the kids away. It's like really annoying. Uh, they also have um, an ex-partner who routinely files the report on them so that they get their benefits canceled and then they have to fight to get their benefits back like every month. So everything helps. And I really appreciate the kind of support that we pull together for John Misha. Thank you so much. Um, oh, and that's the other thing. This is important. Um, so that was that was this. John Mishia. Um, and, um, but also here are some resources for the rest of you in these next three minutes that are not me, because I'm not the only person who does this. Okay, so um, there's an organization called Foundations for Divergent Minds. I highly recommend that you check them out um, and support them and encourage people um, to take their training or engage with them. They um, are an all autistic, all person of color run. Um, one of them might be white. Anyway, sorry. Anyway, they, um, <clears throat> they have been foundational activists in this community for a number of years. Um, their autism diagnoses are older than most of the people in the room. And they, um, they do a lot of work specifically for adults and the idea of like reshaping the community. Okay. So uh, Divergent Design Studios is um, a community run by someone named Marta Rose. And actually um, it started out as this idea of like being a place where you could workshop design ideas, but it actually has turned into like an executive function support network. But don't say that because they actually don't believe in executive function. And I actually like respect that. But it's like a place where people come and help each other. Okay, so Divergent Design Studios. And then if you're on Facebook, there's the Neurodiversity Make It Thing. There's a collection of Facebook groups run by a big collective of people um, on Facebook called Neurodiversity But Make It 
fashion, neurodiversity, but make it community, neurodiversity, but make it parents, et cetera. There's like a bunch of them. Um, and then um, you can also look online for things like um, autistify your habitat. And oh, look, I already had that one, but I forgot. Well, I already had neurodivergent, but make it community, but I forgot. So if you look up things about autistifying your habitat, this has to do with like abolishing the sticky note police and letting yourself have all the visual reminders. And, um, and there are just some really excellent ways to make visual and tactile representations of the things that you need to do in your environment. Uh, and then the no end in sight void hashtag on social media is a way to find neurodivergent people who also deal with chronic illness. Um, and if you're scholarly, here are some of my papers. Um, the paper that the research that I talked about at the beginning of the talk went into is this cyborg assemblages paper, how autistic adults construct socio-technical networks to support cognitive function. Um, Lambda and the limits of sentience is a paper that I wrote with a student of mine, Sharon Clark. And this was about how the way we talk about machine learning uh, has implications for the way that we as a society feel about disabled people. And we wrote this before I was accused of being a bot. So that was kind of weird. And then I also have work with Amelia Gibson called Who, Who's in Charge? Disability Justice and Technology Infrastructure in the United States. Um, and so those second two, they're really easy to find online. They're not paywalled or anything. Okay, I believe that we no longer have a captioner, I think, or the captioner is, is like done at two. Anyway, um, it's over. <laughs> I'm gonna stay on to like sort through some of this stuff and make sure that I've saved everything. And um, I really appreciate all of you and I love all my neurodivergent beans. And I hope to see you around the internet. And um, I appreciate you. And I hope that you got something out of this. And I hope that it was good and not bad or a waste of time. Okay. Love you. Bye.